Hello, Phil Lisbon. It's really great to be here. It's been an amazing week so far, and so much more to go. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, a whole set of things that you can help build uh, during this time period. Uh, this is a great time in our ecosystem to build. There's a lot of new pieces of infrastructure coming online uh, that everyone can use. Uh, FVM is coming around the corner. That's going to enable a whole new swath of applications. And it's also crypto winter, which is a great time to build. So uh, usually, in general, most of, the, um, most of the major movements in crypto have been built uh, during crypto winter. So this is a great moment for uh, you to go and start something uh, pretty compelling. So I wanted to frame a lot of that with a broader request for startups. So I'm going to go through a whole bunch of ideas here um, that to inspire uh, you to go out and build some of these things. And if you come up with some of these kinds of things, uh, reach out to our community, reach out to our ecosystem, and uh, there will be a lot of funding lined up for, for things like this. Uh, so I'll give a quick kind of intro to this moment and kind of like why it's a especially good time to build. Um, I'll talk about some of the resources for builders, and then I'll kind of go through the request for startups. Uh, so uh, Falcoin is a decentralized uh, network that is aiming to build this efficient and robust foundation for humanity's information. Uh, the broader master plan, I think everybody is kind of pretty familiar with this at this point, but you know, step one is to build the world's largest decentralized uh, storage network. We've done that. We've built a massive uh, network across the world, across continents, and that's going uh, really great. Now we're very focused on onboarding uh, data into the network and enabling really smooth storage and retrieval pathways to be able to uh, safeguard all of this data and then be able to use it in a variety of applications with sub-second uh, retrievability. And the next step after that, that a number of folks are already working on, but there's going to be a much bigger focus next year and the year after that, is to bring computation to the data so that you can build meaningful applications um, in these areas. So in terms of storage onboarding, uh, there's been an enormous amount of growth this year. So we're almost clo very close to 300 pe uh, petabytes of data, which is uh, really am amazing. Um, and you know, huge kudos to the entire network for, for achieving this. This is uh, remarkable, given you know, like, the growth this year has been amazing. Uh, and all of that onboarding happens through a set of uh, data on ramps and the Falcon Plus economic structure. Uh, then in the computing side, uh, this is where FBM is going to come in to make a huge, uh, huge splash. Uh, and it's going to enable a whole set of uh, com decentralized computation networks to be able to work on top of the data. So there's a, a, um, uh, there was a hackathon for FBM uh, over the weekend. Uh, I think there's going to be another one uh, coming up. And then there's a Compute Over Data Summit uh, later, I think to, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So if you're interested in all of these areas, uh, definitely uh, check those out. So Falcon is going to become this extremely good L1 for decentralized compute networks because it's going to have all of the data there, plus all of the storage providers already have a ton of GPUs that can be used to run the computation um, uh, over the data. So think of um, there being many different decentralized compute networks that emerge using different cryptographic constructions, different primitives, um, and different communities, different use cases. And Falcon wants to be a really great home for all of those. Uh, so if we sort of like get this part right, if we get the computation part right, um, and we get the, the storage and retrieval and so on uh, right enough for applications, uh, then we can get to finally enabling proper web scale applications in Web3. So today, um, the blockchain world like, does not remotely scale to the, the kind of needs required by, by modern um, massive scale applications, and we need to get there. So um, I kind of uh, gave this challenge out to the, to the whole community. I just wanted a quick reminder um, about this. I, I talked about this at the Phil Austin um, uh, uh, event. And so just a reminder to folks that in these quarters, focus on growing the network, bring, uh, bring more, more people into, um, into the community. Now, I want to touch on these resources for builders. Um, there's a lot of stuff that our ecosystem does in order to enable various groups to help uh, get started. So one part of that is just hackathons. So there's a, we r either directly run or partner with lots of different hackathons out there to help p uh, groups get to know the technology, get to play around with it, get to try, um, try out their ideas, and so on. And this enables a lot of, a lot of people to um, test out their, their, their applications and find something that could be a, a very compelling use case. Um, it's super exciting that many, many groups who either met through hackathons or the actual applications they submitted as hackathon projects have now turned out to be um, applications that went on to um, become businesses and raise funding and so on. So the whole um, builder ecosystem is working super well. 
Um, so the hackathons uh, are a great um, uh, opportunity for a lot of folks to get started. And then out of that, uh, there's a whole swath of grant programs uh, there to support either kind of directed development on certain areas that are really important and meaningful to the ecosystem. So for example, there's a whole swath of grants around Falcon Green and the push to become um, uh, properly uh, carbon neutral or car carbon negative. Um, there's grants associated with data onboarding uh, uh, pipelines and so on um, and more. But there's also kind of undirected micro grants that uh, lots of uh, folks can get access to where if they build something in a hackathon or they want to try out um, something, there's kind of like small grants available for people to uh, be able to get started. It's uh, when you sort of look at the world right now, uh, it's still fairly difficult to start a, a new project or start a company or something like that. People often can't afford to just stop working for even a month to be able to kind of try out their idea. So these micro grants are there uh, to enable people to do that. And one other, other thing that we uh, help with is kind of these requests for startups, where we articulate uh, potential ideas, potential business models, and so on, so that that might um, either you know, kind of uh, help tell the world that we are interested in these ideas and we're interested in funding these. Uh, and sometimes they might end up inspiring, uh, inspiring people. Uh, then there's kind of beyond uh, starting, once projects be, uh, start scaling, start working, and so on. Uh, there are accelerators that, that can turn projects into businesses. There's, of course, VC funding to enable kind of funding and scaling of, of companies and scaling of businesses. Uh, the Phil VC program is uh, really cool. We had the first, um, first of these events uh, in Phil Singapore, and it was pretty massive. Um, and there's you know, a whole swath of, of groups in the ecosystem that have raised um, large amounts of funding. And there's now a nascent uh, network capital funding structure. So this is to fund and scale public goods. Uh, so this is you know, very new, and it's um, a part of the Falcon and the Ethereum ecosystems. And we're very focused on, on trying to create structures to help um, grow public, public goods. Uh, so with that, uh, let's dive in into a bunch of ideas. So uh, these are. Uh, a set of categories that I want to go through today and kind of um, I'll go in th through some of those in more detail um, uh, than others. And I'll kind of leave some time for questions at the end uh, in case people want to dig into any of these more uh, and so on. So I want to start with storage on ramps. So as I mentioned before, the way that storage gets onto Falcon is through a set of storage on ramp uh, systems and products. Uh, so you can think of this as Web3 storage, which um, you may, may already know about, or NFT.storage, which is a very specific on-ramp tuned for um, a specific use case. The reason this stuff works really well, the reason these on-ramps on work, is that you need to tune the product, tune the APIs, tune the documentation, tune the branding to a very specific vertical. And so by, with, with Falcon, it's a super general tool, right? And so by enabling these the specific storage on-ramps, you can target different verticals and craft a product specific to that set of use cases. So the APIs and the documentation and the branding and so on that will work really well for NFT developers is not the same thing that, for example, would work for video developers. So we now need something like a video storage on ramp. So this is totally open. Um, this is something that uh, somebody out there could go and build. Um, we need some kind of uh, on ramp for video de uh, developers to be able to use to very smoothly kind of upload video and retrieve it uh, and get to kind of like a really high quality sub second retrieval, um, do all the integrations to Saturn and similar um, uh, systems to be able to enable that kind of a CDN quality um, of viewing of whatever videos. There's also things like uh, token gating or, or content policy uh, constraints and so on that are very relevant for video developers. And so there totally could be a platform here that just targets that set of use cases. Uh, and so this is kind of like ripe for, um, for somebody to go and start something. Uh, similar to video.storage, you could attempt archive.storage. So there's a lot of systems out there uh, with the goal of creating a, these important open access, sometimes open access, sometimes private access uh, archives, where they're handling l massive amounts of data. And what they really want to be able to do is kind of uh, identify all the metadata associated with, with some archive, uh, be able to query that metadata and find the specific um, subsets of things that they want to be able to retrieve. And then in some cases, uh, couple that data to computation. Or if the data is um, 
um, needs to be kind of moved to a specific location to be computed on, then be able to retrieve the data in larger scales. Uh, so if you think of uh, tools and systems like um, archive, or uh, archive being uh, the, the paper uh, archive, like the scientific paper archive, or bioarchive, or things like that. Imagine building a developer platform for those developers that kind of sits in between Filecoin and them to, to tune the platform for their use cases. Um, so this is kind of what, the, what this uh, tooling would be associated with. Uh, the kind of focus areas here would be in kind of associating CIDs with other identifiers relevant in the archival communities. So there's lots of different kinds of um, identifiers that, that communities and libraries and museums already care about. Um, so it's a lot of kind of metadata-oriented uh, packaging, plus also being able to do things in a reproducible way, fully reproducible way, where sometimes there's archives of code or archives of um, this kind of like interactive hypermedia, and so being able to kind of bundle all of that so that it's all reproducible um, uh, is an important piece. Uh, similar to that, we, could, we need a kind of like a developer tools on ramp. Uh, so once you start dealing with uh, code repositories and package managers and OS images and container images and all of that kind of stuff, there are specific requirements about how those tools move around, the specific integrations to, to tools like Git and tools like you know, all the package managers like NPM and Apt and so on. Um, and there's a bunch of like, really nice uh, optimizations that you can do once you understand the underlying formats behind containers or behind VMs and so on. So a, a kind of developer-oriented on-ramp that just tackles that set of, uh, that swath of things could be a, a super successful um, uh, business and super successful uh, project. Uh, so now you can, you can just generally look at categories of applications and think about, try thinking through how to bring those into Filecoin, and often there might be like a missing piece there, and so that, that might suggest uh, a different kind of, different kind of on-ramp. Uh, I want to plug uh, tooling for data DAOs. So data DAOs are um, you know, DAOs or co-ops or communities that are oriented in terms of uh, being able to gather and curate some particular data sets, being able to, to over time transform them and, and improve the quality of the data or ga continue gathering an ongoing uh, amount of data and then be able to govern the use and licensing of that data, being able to decide how that data gets computed over and so on. And what's rate limiting this is basically tooling for those communities to organize. So think of uh, maybe adapting some of the DAO tooling that exists today, or, or potentially starting from scratch in some cases. Um, but we need, we need some kind of uh, tools that enable these communities to come together, manage their membership, manage their, their priorities and their goals and the work they're going to do, um, and then be able to kind of decide how to apply licenses to their data and, and all that kind of stuff. So all of this is kind of like a, like a rate limited by a single um, end user product um, uh, tool. Great. So uh, I'm going to, again, going to move really fast through a lot of these because there's uh, a bunch of stuff to go through, and I want to have some, uh, some time for questions. So we talked about video storage, but there's also all kinds of processing pipelines that you could also enable um, once you have the video stored somewhere. Um, there's a great talk um, uh, from LifePeer yesterday uh, at the, uh, the Fluence uh, and Peer-to-Peer -peer meetup uh, close by, uh, where we saw this kind of whole swath of different pipelines that you could build using uh, the LifePeer tooling. And so this is a perfect uh, example of being able to onboard the video into Filecoin. And once it's there, you can use the, the LifePeer network to then start processing it, uh, that video. And you can do all kinds of uh, you know, encoding and, and re-encoding and so on, post-processing, like blurring faces or adding subtitles or blending with creator tools or using um, AI models either to do object recognition and tag the video and what's going on or you potentially even generate some of the video. So there's all kinds of like really interesting potential um, startups here. Uh, then uh, the HODL uh, team has built like this really compelling video SDK that enables kind of video calls and video streaming and so on. And so that, that is also ripe for, for a bunch of different applications and tools to be built, um, built on top of it. Uh, there's, there's also these massive scale archives. So think of Flickr and so on, where um, there's just extremely beautiful uh, galleries even of also open access imagery um, that just are still kind of trapped in the Web 2 world. And it'd be really great to be able to back up all of that stuff in Web 3 and then be able to use uh, some of those images for, for various kinds of things. So that, first off, like creating a, a structure for being able to move around um, these repositories of, of images and photos and, and videos. Um, and then be able to kind of tag and annotate and curate those data sets, 
and then beyond be able to write applications on top of these. So you, you know, imagine being able to sort of plug in these data sources into creator tools and, and so on. Uh, and that brings me to stock photography and video. So, you know, if you if you do this part, like that's like you know half halfway to uh, having a full kind of economic model on top of this, where you can now start rewarding people t for for producing these uh, the the photo and video and so on. Uh, today, like all of these stock photography and video uh, uh, companies and whatnot are. Um, just stuck in Web 2, and they're, they're like these kind of intermediaries that extract massive fees. So it is a common occurrence in these communities, uh, kind of like year over year. You can find forum posts like going back o over a decade where these communities of creators are like really frustrated with the extractive fees that these platforms uh, tend to charge. And over time, those platforms get, are getting commoditized. So a lot of the software involved in producing this, um, these kinds of systems um, is not that complex, so this this seems ripe uh, to to be disrupted by a, a Web3 oriented um, oriented platform that could bring a much more um, a much pro more proper um, kind of marketplace transaction structure. Uh, you could also start playing around with different kinds of uh, transaction structures other than like the, just the the very basic um, uh, royalty structure. There could be ways of kind of interconnecting the assets, seeing kind of um, how they get used over time, or for example, being able to to um, embed them in a way that where they sort of like share revenue structures with with whatever gets arrived. Like all of that uh, is you know put possible in the in the um, in the near future. Now, of course, you can also do you know pay per view media like token gated pages and you know token gated mo movies and music and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that could be token gated because you're part of a particular group um, that gets access to that media, or it could be token gated in that it's kind of like pay per view in in, in some way. Uh, great. Let's go to. Um, I'm going to jump to games for a moment before going to metaverse and social. So, uh, games are a huge fraction of the of the activity that that people uh, engage in, uh, just in general, but but especially over the internet. Um, and so, games are a big part of people's lives. Uh, this is there's been a number of kind of Web3 oriented games, but they've mostly focused on on kind of like the economic structures. It would be really great to just kind of put that aside for a while and just focus on making really high quality games in Web3 that leverage the decentralized structure. So, for example, you can play with mechanics like having full virtual worlds that are mutable in some way uh, and that are persistent in some communities that are not kind of like. Um, where the developers are not sort of on the hook for having to figure out the future of those events, uh, you could create kind of um, you know imagine like those large scale MMOs, but instead of kind of the developers of the game to have to figure out the storylines and what changes and what kind of um, gets developed, imagine that being communities and community decisions of what how those um, those those w virtual worlds evolve. Uh, so yeah, think of like uh, being able to take whatever like genre of MMO and being able to produce a Web3 equivalent where communities um, are kind of steering the direction of where where these storylines are going. Um, I think all of that is that it, that is uh, possible now. Uh, VR is an area where um, the the just size of the assets and, and size of the of the of the kind of data distribution and so on will really matter because these things are going to get higher and higher fidelity and especially if you add any kind of dynamic and uh, um, Environment that's changing in some significant way that'll that'll be kind of um, very information uh, transfer intensive, and that's an area where IPFS becomes extremely useful to be able to have like local uh, networks or peer-to-peer -peer distribution of of these things. So jumping into the metaverse, so we've seen amazing success with the with the Mona community in enabling creators to build whole um, virtual worlds. Uh, I think the next step on top of that is to be able to imbue these worlds with programmability and being able to create experiences. So think of being able to craft the experience of being in a conference in one of these environments, or being in a, in a social hangout, or in being at a party, or being at a concert, or um, being in a class in a classroom. Um, or being just kind of in, in a like large uh, social meetup or something like that. All of these different experiences will carry different kinds of interaction, and that different interaction needs to be programmed specific to that use case. So being able to imbue these kinds of platforms with that programmability is, I think, like the major next um, next step. And, and that might be you know, creating a modular structure where like, these different uh, components could be um, kind of somebody could write an, a specific application and then plug in the room as a parameter, or, or vice versa, where they program a specific experience to be associated with that particular room. And that once you start going into that um, environment, you can start thinking about you know, uh, 
galleries and museums, or even like you know historically realistic environments. Imagine being able to have like you know a, a um, full uh, virtual world that's like some kind of recreation of some particular period in history, and being able to sort of jump into it. Um, the uh, and then there's of course like large scale open virtual worlds. So we've seen a lot of this kind of stuff with Decentraland and CryptoVoxes and whatnot, um, but. But we have, still haven't gotten like, the mechanics of these games like, really right. Um, there's some, some kind of a gap between these and, say, Minecraft, where you have like, this open air, area of exploration where you're able to construct um, uh, things together, and it's an extremely fun experience and so on. So I think all of this stuff remains super open, and a lot of groups could be like you know, huge call out to, to groups interested in building these kinds of things uh, to try new, new kinds of structures. Um, and so I think you know, we really want to kind of end up with, with an envir environment that is highly dynamic, that is super engaging, super, super fun, uh, kind of like, like Minecraft. Um, now, of course, like the could be very different uh, structures, different art and, and whatnot, but think of like, you know, these kinds of fun environments. So social has eluded Web3 for quite a while. Uh, and there's a lot of really good reasons for that. I think the computing platform is not ready for, for it yet. Um, I don't think. I still don't think it's quite ready for this yet. Um, I think if you try doing decentralized social today, you're going to be forced into Web 2.5, just because the, the decentralized compute networks are not there yet, and, and you can't quite do all of the processing that you need to in a backend um, in a Web 3 native way. Uh, but I think this is going to be ready kind of in two, two to three years from now. Uh, so if, this might be the, the time to start experimenting with these structures and start uh, trying kind of like a Web 2.5 version to then kind of smoothly upgrade into Web 3. Um, one important thing to remember about social is that it's constantly changing and evolving. So one approach might be to kind of um, just straight up like try and replicate existing systems, but that's you know, kind of less likely to work. The other approach is to think ahead to what will be the major next social movement, uh, the, the next social uh, application, and just build for that directly. Right? So think, think of the evolution of social networks as being constantly like this, this um, things are changing uh, a lot. You know, think of TikTok uh, as one of the latest uh, uh, social networks that you know, came in and dethroned um, you know, whatever came before. So this is always kind of not fully open. Like, this is always open for some new, super compelling, um, very engaging uh, system. So maybe you could start thinking about that structure, testing it out, and so on. And then kind of once the, the Web3 platform is there and ready, you can, you can scale that. Um, there's a use case that's like super near and dear uh, to me, which is the decentralized science movement. Um, uh, DSI is, a, is, a, is trying to improve science, including you know, funding structures and open access and making science itself reproducible, helping organize groups, helping um, create regenerative funding structures, um, and all of this. And so DSI is like the intersection of the open access science movement plus the Web3 um, new, new kind of economics uh, movement. Uh, it's a pretty large movement. There's lots of uh, groups uh, involved in it. Um, there's things like you know, kind of uh, mixing kind of IP NFTs uh, and so on to be able to fund um, R and D. Um, there's you know, IPFS itself started with kind of a goal of being able to distribute machine learning data, data sets and being a component in kind of like a GitHub for science. Um, think of being able to kind of collaborate on all of the, all of the scientific artifacts um, and kind of papers and so on uh, in kind of a, a Web3 native way. And then potentially later, you can start thinking about being able to weave all of the uh, interactions between uh, different groups and, and scientists and papers and so on um, in kind of like this credit attribution graph that can then be, be rewarded. Um, there's, of course, like specific, e even kind of very Im important tactical things that could be done now where like just take the peer review process and make it more fair by enabling like um, funding structure to support the peer review process. There's some protocols that are already trying this stuff. Um, there's being able to kind of turn the, the traditional paper structure into something more useful and more, more um, intelligent, where you can annotate it with like the CIDs to the data that they're referencing, or the paper itself can get a, a, a CID over time. And the references should be kind of immutable. You should be able to kind of have a CID of the reference so you know like what exactly it's, it's um, citing. Um, and you should be able to dive into all of the data involved in, in producing those papers and all of the code involved in producing those papers. So think of kind of all of the artifacts of science and being able to kind of uh, create, put those in kind of a, a structure that is much more uh, amenable to collaboration and um, you know, more machine readable and, and so on. 
Um, the reproducible, re reproducibility piece is a, a really big one. It's surprisingly difficult to get 100% you know, reproducibility for a lot of the um, uh, code that scientists end up using. And so kind of chipping away at this problem would be extremely, extremely useful and valuable to make sure that the, that the um, experiments that we're running and the data we're producing is, is really good. And then there's, of course, also just always broadening access to, to science, right? So um, being able to move around um, papers and being able to give open access um, give really high quality open access um, uh, to, to these papers to people will be extremely useful. So one important constraint here is, you know, in, since IPFS started, um, we've seen both the EU and the US uh, kind of mandate that open access become a really big thing, except that there are a bunch of the publishers are still kind of like forcing people to go to their websites and kind of like, um, and so on. So it would be really great to have like full open access portals for all of the scientific literature and, and, and all of the data and so on that never has to kind of go through, through, those, um, uh, through those websites. Uh, and then there's, of course, being able to do massive scale science. So once we have the data, once we have the computing, um, computer for data uh, networks and so on, we're going to be able to do large scale science, uh, scientific computing directly on, on these platforms. So you know, massive call to action to, uh, to help decide. Uh, so now there's a bunch of stuff around Web3 infrastructure. So being able to do these decentralized compute networks, I'm going to speak about those more in a moment. Um, but there's also much more specific stuff, like being able to build an incentivized DHT, or incentivized PubSub, or incentivized Byzantine broadcast. There's all of these kind of, kind of underlying primitives that having an incentivized and secure um, a primitive would be extremely useful to all of the blockchains building. So those are those are kind of like ripe opportunities for, for groups. You can take something like you know Kademlia from Lip2P and like just add incentives to it, or you can take something like Gossip Sub and add incentive, incentives to it. Now on the compute uh, networks piece. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, but eventually we'll end up with multiple compute networks. And so like I mentioned earlier, we want Falcon to be this really great L1 for, for all of these. Um, and so th either th if you're really interested in computation in one particular use case, think of building one of those compute networks, or think of building tooling to support um, these kinds of systems. Um, the, you know, think of like things like Kubernetes and so on, and kind of inspiring the kind of uh, Bacalao network and, and similar systems. And the way in which you kind of mix um, specific cryptographic primitives, like you know, fully homomorphic encryption, or MPC, or zero knowledge proofs, and so on, all of that might yield different networks. So think of like being able to use a lot of the tooling that, that's there to be able to kind of derive a specific, um, specific network. All of this is going to kind of evolve a lot uh, throughout next year. But hopefully, once we kind of build these, we can have a computing platform in Web3 that it gives you, uh, you know, close to the same kind of experience as you get in Web2. Uh, you know, it sort of claimed that like Web3 is not going to succeed until we, you know, a developer facing the, the options of going between Web2 and Web3 finds it dramatically easier and better and smoother to, be, to work in Web3. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do to, to get there. And the good news is that all of this is kind of like ripe for, for building startups. Um, and you know, when you think about uh, decentralized computation, there's all kinds of different architecture components. And you can think of all of these as potentially um, you know, good opportunities to, to, um, to build these. Uh, there's one thing I want to call out, which is kind of interoperability between different blockchain networks. So today, all of these blockchains have to maintain their state and have to kind of archive old state and have to reference data and so on. And Falcon is perfect for all of that, and it's kind of built to be this kind of, um, you know, the massive scale uh, network hard drive for all of the other blockchains. Um, and so making sure that there's really good interconnectivity between these, um, enabling those systems to be able to tap into Falcon to be able to store um, themselves and so on, like, will be, will be really, really useful. So um, there's a whole bunch of uh, kind of like crypto utilities you can think of. Um, uh, I'll kind of like go through these last ideas like very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, you can think of Filecoin itself as a crypto utility where you want to provide storage and retrieval of data to the whole world. Um, and you want that to be kind of like not a specific corporation, a specific nation state, but you want it to be kind of like this broad utility, digital utility that, um, uh, that everyone can use. You can think of whether XM, um, the kind of like, uh, decentralized weather station network in a similar kind of way. But just like that, there could be lots of different kinds of utilities that, that serve some important purpose um, in, in society um, built in this kind of way. So you can think of like networking itself, like you know, the Helium network is, is trying to do kind of um, 
LoRa and uh, 5G and so on, but there could be other, other types of networks there. Uh, it would be great to, you know, in the future to be able to use um, you know, cell phones directly from a crypto um, uh, service provider, right? So like, be able to like, connect your cell phone to some, um, to some tower that is like, crypto-powered. Um, or be able to use uh, crypto utilities to do the routing in the underlying parts of the internet, be able to do BGP and, and the broader routing across, uh, across networks this way. So think of, um, there's just tons of work to do here uh, and a lot of good, really good opportunities still. Um, AI, I think, so, so the crypto and AI merger is going to come at some point, and that's going to be a really um, big, big part um, of, this, of the, both of these movements. Um, I think the thing that's really limiting this is being able to have um, data centers that are crypto powered that are that support AI. So it's pretty hard to do this. Um, as we were talking about this yesterday, you have to do this massive scale build out of the hardware, and you have to arrange it in a very specific kind of way to support AI models. Uh, so th this is um, a, a uh, uh, my guess is that there's going to be kind of like a very specialized uh, network that emerges just to support uh, crypto-powered AI, AI models, and that's kind of like a really strong opportunity right now. Um, there's a lot of possibilities around the funding the commons or, or um, uh, funding public goods uh, movement, which is, you know, there's lots of different kinds of mechanisms that are being explored, lots of different uh, things like impact certificates, uh, you know, hypercerts and impact evaluators and new organizational structures and so on. All of these are sort of rate limited by products, like end user products that people can, can use. So there's a, a lot of opportunities here. A bunch of these have been, you know, last year we started um, this conference to try and accumulate a lot of um, articulations of these, of these programs and systems and so on. And so now we have, you know, 100, like I think over 100 now, um, talks and videos that describe a bunch of this stuff. And so that presents a, a massive opportunity for builders because the kind of articulation of how these, these might work and the possibilities are now there. And so you can kind of go and pick a bunch of different potential things, see if something is really interesting uh, to you, and then kind of build, build from there. Uh, there's also, we've also seen like the massive success that Gitcoin and the Gitcoin community has had with um, kind of allocating uh, capital better in a kind of community oriented way. It'd be really amazing to kind of like improve the success by bringing those primitives to lots of different specific areas. And so being able to use Gitcoin itself to be able to run rounds in specific areas, like being able to fund research in some areas or being able to fund development of some specific products. Um, and so, and, and that could potentially be imbued into applications themselves. So, um, you know, if you start thinking of Gitcoin as a platform that you can develop with, um, there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. Then there's a broader kind of like credit assignment of being able to um, articulate all of the kind of individual activity that, that people or groups or organizations or projects have and kind of what is the, what is the impact over time and to be able to turn this into a large scale kind of credit attribution uh, graph. If we have that, then we can fund these systems better. So like there's a large opportunity here for just somebody to build an on-chain structure and, and on-chain primitives to just do arbitrary credit attribution uh, assignment. And so that means like just create you know, some smart contract that enables you to to assign credit for something, and that is kind of chainable, so you can use that to reference other nodes and so on. And, and once we have like the individual kind of like neuron in this, in this network, you can start connecting these over time, and you know, over a year or two years or three years, flesh out what the network is, um, and then use it for, for funding systems. Um, the last two ideas, so one is around local and offline first applications. So the blockchain world is not quite yet capable of offline first. It will be, you'll see. Um, uh, but you can start with kind of IPFS today and think of building applications to, be, to work in a local first environment. So think of the standard kind of personal computing suite of tools like spreadsheets and documents and, and so on, and be able to provide like really high quality versions of those that work in a kind of modern real-time editing sort of way, but have that work entirely offline first or local first, where that could work in a room without having to go to the rest of the world. Um, and um, the, the last one is uh, real estate. So I think that blockchain is going to be massive for real estate. It has a bunch of the primitives already. It has the NFT structure to be able to assign, um, kind of be able to point to a specific um, uh, land, piece of land or a specific house or, or a fraction of it and so on. And it has all of the financialized tooling to be able to um, reference all of the kinds of transactions that real estate uh, deals with, all of the kinds of marketplaces and auctions and transaction histories and so on. 
What's missing is being able to create the kind of verifiable claims tooling to be able to have kind of like the map of the world with all of the land and all of the buildings and being able to have the, the buildings themselves like map onto or like the units themselves be able to map onto the documentation associated with that, that the history of that real estate. So for example, um, think of like um, pictures taken at any one moment in time by any kind of realtor or whatever or somebody buying or selling a house as being part of the history of that, of that particular item and going along with it. So think of like you know, creating an NFT associate, associating with an apartment or a house or something and being able to see every single thing related to that, to that um, house or that building in the history of that, that object. So you know, inspections, um, like notices, all of uh, you know, whatever is relevant, like who, who sort of like has owned it in the past, and being able to build a you know, wholly you know, international real estate market that is kind of user first, that gives people like actually the knowledge that they often require when they're kind of trying to uh, enter into some of the most important transactions of their lives would be extremely, extremely useful. Think of like how much information gets hidden from people because there isn't a good transparent way to show like what you know, a, a kind of ledger of information associated with these objects. So but, um, I claim that real estate is going to be massive massive in crypto, but probably you know, in the next two to, two to five years. And I think the startups that are going to build this are going to get started you know, sometime now or in the next year. Uh, cool. So that's like the request for startups that I had for you. Um, I'll, um, maybe I'll take like one or two questions, but I, seeing the clock, I think it's already over. So uh, I'll take two questions, and then that's it.